Good morning, teachers and students. My name is Dr. Andrew Hemming. I teach criminal law and evidence in the School of Law and Justice at the University of Southern Queensland. Today, I'm going to be talking in my little overview of criminal laws in Australia. My title is The Mosaic of Criminal Laws in Australia. The purpose of this uh, talk is to in inform you and get you to understand that the criminal laws in Australia differ greatly. And they differ greatly because responsibility for criminal laws in Australia was given to the states, as in the United States, and not the Commonwealth, as was the case in Canada, where there's just one criminal code for the whole country. So if you were to be um, charged in Canada with a criminal offence, it wouldn't matter whether it took place in Vancouver or in, on the eastern uh, seaboard in um, Toronto or Montreal because they have the one criminal jurisdiction. And that's because Canada uh, chose in its founding um, constitutional document to give criminal laws to the Commonwealth, the federal government. Unlike Australia, which gave responsibility to the states. This means that Australia has this mosaic of criminal laws. And as you can see from the slide, I've bro broken this um, mosaic down into three regimes. Very approximate, but it serves for the purposes of analysis. We have what are euphemistically described as the common law states of New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia. So they don't just rely on the common law, they do have statutes. In the case of New South Wales and Victoria, they're referred to as Crimes Acts. Then you've got what are called the Griffith Codes, after Sir Samuel Griffith, the states of Queensland, West Australia and Tasmania. And then finally, we have the Commonwealth Code, which was um, produced in 1995 in an attempt to get some degree of uniformity, but unfortunately only the territories and the ACT, that's uh, Australian Capital Territory and the Northern Territory, um, chose to follow. So that's the broad um, brush mosaic of criminal laws in Australia. So we have basically three broad groupings of criminal laws in Australia. Now, um, I mentioned the Griffith Code and Queensland. In 1899, Sir Samuel Griffith, then the Chief Justice of Queensland, uh, and a former Premier, persuaded the Queensland government to adopt what is known today as the Griffith Code. This is somewhat misnamed because in reality, um, Griffith plagiarised, I think I can use that word, um, to a large extent, um, a, uh, an English code bill that failed to get through in 1880 in, in England after Sir James Stephen. Um, the fundamental design of this code remains intact after some 121 years, despite being locked in 19th century criminal fault theory. And the prime reason that this code survives is because lawyers are very familiar with it, and the legal profession, being a very conservative one, is somewhat averse to reform. So if you are studying criminal law in, a, in uh, Queensland, you need to be aware of the antecedents of its background and the fact that it is locked into this 19th century um, criminal jurisprudence. So um, I just thought I'd show you here the, what my particular hero. So ev every lecturer has their own preferences and their slight prejudices. So my hero is Sir James Fitzjames Stephen, the towering criminal uh, law figure of the 19th century, wrote a monumental history of the criminal laws of England and provides the foundations of the criminal codes of Canada, New Zealand and Queensland. Um, I call the unsung hero and the poseur. I regard Sir Samuel Griffith as a bit of a poseur, a quintessential political player who glossed over his debt to Stephen, um, exaggerated his efforts to meet the criticisms of the bill in his own work. Um, and another criticism you can level at the great man is that at the uh, convention debates, he failed to speak up for the Canadian model and as a result 
we have this mosaic of criminal laws, which has been the bane of criminal law reform or consistent criminal law reform in this country ever since 1901. Um, <clears throat> just to put a constitutional perspective on this, I'll just go back a slide uh, to, to um, the comment here about uh, not giving the, uh, the uh, federal government the responsibility. For those of you familiar with Australia's constitution, look at section 51. And section 51 gives the powers of the Commonwealth. So when all the convention delegates, including Griffith, were sitting down in the 1890s to discuss what powers they were going to give to this fledgling government that was going to be called the Commonwealth Government of Australia, um, they had various models to look at. And they chose, unfortunately, for in the case of criminal law, the United States model of leaving it with the states rather than the Canada's decision to give it to the federal government. So section 51, for those of you interested in Australian constitutional history, that is um, where you look to see what the powers of the Commonwealth are. So it's important for you to understand that the technical background to any offence is determined by the architecture of the code or the Crimes Act that you're dealing with. So the Griffith Codes, because they are locked in this 19th century jurisprudence, typically do not specify a fault element. A fault element such as intention or knowledge or recklessness or negligence. Um, so let us look at a typical example of a Griffith Code offence, the crime of rape. Um, it says, section 349, subsection 1, basically says, any person who rapes another is guilty of a crime. So there's no fault element spelt there, spelt out there. Um, it's really one of consent. So the defendant in a rape trial here in Queensland relies on the defence of mistake and fact. It's effectively rape in Queensland is effectively a crime of strict liability. Contrast the uh, Queensland offence of rape with that of the offence of rape in the Northern Territory. Now, the Northern Territory has chosen to follow the Commonwealth Criminal Code's architecture and specifies a fault element for every crime. And you can see here that in the Northern Territory uh, criminal code for the offence of rape, you see, without the other person's consent and knowing about or being reckless as to the lack of consent. And then they go on in subsection 4a to define reckless as including not giving any thought as to whether or not the other person is consenting. So if the defendant's uh, defence is, well, I never thought to ask, you can see that there's a very different likely outcome in Northern Territory to that of Queensland, where there is no fault element specified. Now, it's useful to think in fault element terms of a staircase or a stepladder of fault elements. So you're familiar that for every crime there is what's called an actus reus, which means the physical act, and mens rea, which is the guilty mind. So there has to be a coincidence of the fault element and the physical element. The actus rea, the act, and the mens rea, the mental act. So you've got here a step ladder of criminal responsibility. So at the top of the ladder, you've got intention and knowledge. So Typically, for murder, you have to have an intent to kill or cause grievous bodily harm. Um, for uh, manslaughter, for example, you might have the fault element of recklessness or negligence. There are offences of strict liability, and I mentioned um, uh, rape. And obviously, most driving offences are ones of strict liability. It doesn't matter that you didn't mean to speed at 65 in a 60 zone. If that's what the uh, machine registered, then you're going to be paying the relevant fine. 
absolute liability is where you can't even rely on the defense of mistake of fact for a defense. So it's these step ladders um, that uh, I'm referring to in terms of grades of responsibility. And in the Griffith Codes, if you have a look at any of the offences in the Queensland Criminal Code, you'll find very rarely will you find a fault element, unlike the Commonwealth Criminal Code, where it is specified in detail. So here I'm trying to convey the essence of the architectural differences in, as part of the mosaic of criminal laws in Australia. So when you embark, if you do, on a legal career and study at, uh, at hopefully at USQ or uh, Queensland universities in law, it's important to immediately understand that what you're studying here in Queensland isn't necessarily the law in other parts of Australia. So if you were to cross the border to New South Wales, you'll be doing, dealing with the New South Wales Crimes Act 1900. And uh, it's a very different beast to the Queensland Criminal Code. Now, trying to put some flesh around this concept of the different mosaic, I've started um, with the, if you like, the top of the criminal calendar, murder. Now, it may surprise you to realise that murder in this country differs in three ways. So, as I mentioned, if you commit a murder in Canada, anywhere in Canada, it's the same law. In Australia, it can differ in three ways. It can differ in terms of the fault element, which I've just tried to explain. It can differ in the definition of grievous bodily harm. And it can differ in re relation to the availability of partial defences to murder of provocation and diminished responsibility. Some jurisdictions in Australia, Queensland is one of them, has both of these defences, provocation and diminished responsibility, where if the defence is successful, murder is reduced to manslaughter. Other jurisdictions, like Victoria, have neither. So you can see immediately, perhaps to your surprise, that um, with such an important uh, crime as, uh, as murder differs in such a fundamental way. And this gets back to the mosaic that is the theme of my talk today. So it was only very recently uh, that Queensland changed the law of murder to match that of New South Wales. Up until... Um, uh, 2020, just very recently, section 302 of the Queensland Criminal Code, which dealt with murder, stopped at 1A, that effectively the only fault element was that of intention. So if I go back to the, the ladder, you can see that for Queensland, intention was the relevant fault element. Very unusual for the Queensland Criminal Code to actually specify a fault element, but there it was, intention, solely intention. New South Wales, on the other hand, has long had an alternative fault element of reckless indifference to human life. So if we go back to the fault, to the step ladder, you can see that's one step down on the ladder. So at last, after 100 odd years, we have at least a match between Queensland and New South Wales as to the fault element for murder. They both now, the Crown has to prove either intention or a reckless indifference to human life. Now, another way in which uh, the fences uh, differ in terms of uh, murder, you've got the um, availability of provocation. Five jurisdictions in, Queen, in Australia, and I've listed them there, Queensland, New South Wales, the ACT, NT and South Australia, have the partial defence mur to murder of manslaughter, which if successful reduces murder to manslaughter. Um, and I've mentioned earlier that even within these defences, they differ. Now in Queensland, the um, legal onus is on the defendant. In, if you're running a, a partial defence to murder or provocation, the legal onus is on the defendant. You find that in section 304, subsection 9. It is for the defence to prove. Now, the onus of proof, 
causes university students some difficulty, so I thought I might just take a moment to try and explain um, what it means, the onus of proof. So the Crown, the prosecution, in a criminal trial always has the legal onus to the standard of beyond reasonable doubt. So if the accused raises a defence, then if the defence, if, if the onus of proof is only evidentiary, which means a reasonable possibility, then the judge will allow the defence to go to the jury, provided the evidential onus is satisfied. So, for example, if you're going to run intoxication, then you, it's necessary to show that the defendant was intoxicated at the time of the incident. If you're going to try and run the defence of self-defence, then you're going to have to show that there was some evidence that, um, uh, that self-defence was invoked, that there was an, an initial assault which was defended. So there's got to be a sort of a minimum, if you like, what's called a reasonable possibility in order for the evidential onus to be satisfied. If the judge is satisfied that there is an evidential onus, then the uh, judge will let that go to the jury and the onus switches to the Crown. So the Crown must not only prove the elements of the offence, if it's murder, and if self-defence is going to uh, the jury, then the Crown also has to negative beyond reasonable doubt the defence of self-defence. That is, if the defence is only an uh, the onus is only an evidential one. However, if the onus on the defence is a legal one, as it is in section 304, subsection 9 here in Queensland for provocation, then the judge will tell the jury they have to be satisfied on the balance of probability that the defence is valid. So examples here are insanity, diminished responsibility and provocation, but only in Queensland. In other jurisdictions, um, for provocation, it's uh, only an evidential onus. So you can see immediately that there are these wide variations, even in one offence, and I've only just scratched the surface in this regard. Um, went past us. So now, I've talked a little bit about defences. So often, um, when you're going to run a defence, You've, you're, you're running a gamut between subjective and objective tests. So what do I mean by that? Where well, you've got a subjective test, uh, the prosecution must prove beyond reasonable doubt that the particular accused had the requisite state of mind that they carried out the external element, the actual act. Whereas where you're dealing with an objective test, the conduct is measured against an ordinary reasonable person placed in a similar situation. This is often the test used for criminal negligence. So, for example, if a person is um, being charged with the criminal negligence of a child so that they starved to death um, or died from neglect, um, in other words, they breached their duty to the child, then the test again for that of criminal negligence would be, well, what would be the situation of an ordinary reasonable person placed in a similar situation? Now, I've given a couple of examples of the difference between subjective and objective tests. So, taking the um, defence of duress, this is that you were forced to do it. Your defence for doing a criminal act is that um, you were you, uh, forced to undertake this activity. So, you might have been forced at gunpoint um, to open a bank safe if you were a, a bank manager. Um, um, so, you can see in this particular section, all the requirements, the elements of the defence, are objective. A person carries out conduct under duress if they reasonably believe, objective, um, although there's an element of subjective in belief, um, there is no reasonable way that the threat can be rendered ineffective, an objective test of necessity, and the conduct is a reasonable response to the threat, so the objective test of proportionality of the response. So you can see that if you're going to run the defence of duress, it's a very objective test. Contrast that with self-defence. So a person carries out conduct in self-defence if the person believes, subjective, the conduct is necessary. So 
Um, that's a very much how you responded to the threat. And that then secondly, um, the conduct of a reason is a reasonable response, objective, in the circumstances as they perceive them, subjective. So whenever you're looking at a defence, whether it be here, self-defence or um, duress, there is always a combination of subjective and objective tests. And this can actually be quite confusing to the jury. So if you think about self-defence um, and how you might, if you were on the jury, listening to an instruction from the judge about whether or not um, the person acted reasonably, but they're still allowed to consider um, that the circumstances in which they perceived uh, the danger. You can see that it's open to a wide degree of interpretation. So concluding my little uh, discussion on the uh, various uh, vagaries of mosaic of criminal laws in, um, in Australia and the prospect of criminal law reform, because I think intrinsically we'd all agree that it would be nice if we had a Canadian situation rather than the US and here. In 1995, the Commonwealth attempted to deal with all this inconsistency, the fact that criminal laws had been placed in the Constitution with the states. They tried manfully, I suppose, or personally, uh, um, to uh, introduce a criminal code, the Criminal Code Commonwealth, based on the US Penal Code as an attempt that hopefully the six states and the two territories would sign up and we would suddenly have um, a uniform criminal jurisdiction in Australia. However, only the ACT and the NT signed up. The six states have ignored it. So um, we continue to have this mosaic because we're a federation and constitutional responsibility for criminal laws is with the states which makes consistent criminal law reform very difficult. So I'd just like to leave you with that thought, that um, trying to move things forward where you've got so many different players with different views and all thinking that their particular criminal code or Crimes Act is the best, it makes consistent criminal law reform very difficult. So my final comment is, Please be aware that when you're studying criminal law in Australia, it is a very different beast depending on which jurisdiction you're in. So thank you for listening and good morning.